Hello, this is Carl Ackerman, host of Journeys of the Mind. And today we are so lucky to have Dr. Pamela Rotner Sakamoto here to talk about her wonderful book. I hope I can get this in. Uh, let's see if it's, it's, it's in here right here, but it's, it's called Midnight in Broad Daylight. And this is round two because she had a lovely interview uh, with the most, um, uh, I guess, uh, the only way I could describe him is Mensch, the Mensch J. Fidel. Uh, interviewed you just as your book was coming out. So uh, welcome, Pam. Thank you so much for having me, Carl. I'm grateful to both you and Jay for inviting me today. So can you give us, you know, the elevator speech about your book? I mean, just the overall view that you have, if you were to describe it, you know, to a publisher, to a bookstore, et cetera, et cetera, just to give our audience sort of an understanding of the, the, you know, the bare outline of, of the book. Okay. It is, um, in a narrative nonfiction account of a Japanese American family divided by war. And it is basically an entirely true saga of um, a family with two parents who were legal immigrants from Japan to the United States and had five American born children. And uh, because the patriarch died uh, quite young and suddenly, uh, the mother. Um, and ultimately the matriarch had to take her children back to Japan where she could afford to live um, from the Seattle area. And two of those children uh, named Harry and Mary, and this is about the Fukuhara family, they uh, couldn't wait to get back to the United States. They identified fully as Americans. And they went back and then this is by this time the late 1930s. And when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, in December 1941, they were on the West Coast. And as Japanese Americans, within a matter of months, they were interned and ultimately sent to Gila River in Arizona. Meanwhile, the rest of the family was back in their native Hiroshima. And um, Harry ended up volunteering for the incipient military intelligence service and a unit of the US Army out of camp in order to escape camp and was sent to the Southwest Pacific. At the same time, knowing that his brothers in Japan had been most likely conscripted into the Japanese military. And by summer of 45, Harry was slated to land on Japan in what would have been a major um, invasion of the archipelago uh, for November 1st. And his brothers were digging in, in precisely the same area that he was slated to land with the first wave of troops. Everything changed when the atomic bombs were detonated, uh, but their mother and eldest brother were in the city, um, in the vicinity of, of strong effects. And this is the true story of their reconciliation, their un, um, unwavering love for one another, um, how an ordinary family um, survived war with brothers on opposing sides. Harry rose to be one of the first Japanese American colonels in the US Army and broke um, the glass ceiling uh, for the next generation. Uh, and he and his entire family joined me in telling this story. And that is it in a nutshell. Yeah, and, and I wanted to point out to our audience, I had, I had said this, um... Uh, to Dr. Sakamoto one, uh, uh, just before the show began, that this book should be read along any U.S. history course because it does such a fine job of describing the interwar period and World War II, which leads me to my first question. So, um, you know, you do a really wonderful job of talking about the interwar period, that is the period between World War I and World War II. And of course, Japan had launched its war in China before the attack on Pearl Harbor. But here's my question for you. It seemed like a pretty difficult time economically, um, especially after the Great Depression, for people to find jobs both in the United States and in Japan. However, I think it was Harry's auntie uh, who owned a co confectioner. I mean, she owned a, a candy store. And I'd like you to talk about, you know, Harry's problems in trying to find jobs in the United States, but also about this candy store, which is just quite remarkable. Oh, thank you for that question. Uh, so Harry, when he went back to the U.S. from Japan, where he spent five years uh, after his dad died and really was fighting every moment that he was there 
to return to the U.S., where he expected to pick up where he left off with lots of friends, um, and many of them were white. Uh, when he returned to his hometown of Auburn, Washington, he was really faced with closed doors. People were aware of the tensions in Asia um, with Japanese aggression, and they associated him um, as Japanese as opposed to American. And he had a Japanese high school degree. He did not have an American one um, and did not have any college yet. And he could not find a job. Um, and he ended up going from Seattle and ultimately ending up in LA and was working at a greengrocer, um, seasonal worker, hired during the business season, fired as soon as lo no longer necessary. And he was really struggling. Um, meanwhile, back in Japan, uh, one of the reasons that his family had moved there originally was that they could have a higher standard of living than if they had stayed in the U.S. Um, and there, there was an aunt, um, his mother's elder sister, who was an entrepreneur, um, really a kind of classic career woman uh, and a huge personality, very generous, very flamboyant, um, and a, a terrific businesswoman. And she had a traditional Japanese sweet shop. Um, people still remember it today. It was so grand that people would dress when they shopped and they would buy these exquisite um, bean paste filled uh, beautifully carved, um, beautifully colored uh, rice treats. And uh, people would serve them with green tea and have them for special occasions. And she was just raking it in. Um, she had a fabulous product, fabulous service, fabulous ambiance, um, and, this, and this exuberant personality. Uh, so she could actually help the family too. Uh, and actually at one point she had... Uh, take care of the eldest sister, the only girl, Mary, and the eldest brother, Victor. They had been in Japan uh, for some time growing up uh, to learn Japanese ways even before they moved back with the family. And so she um, gave a sense of affluence and abundance to the family. Uh, and uh, it was a close-knit family, and they had this magical life. Um, the candy store was a world unto itself. And for a long time, either as Japan um, faced worsening conditions at home in terms of accessibility to food, uh, Aunt Kyo was able to get everything and, and she shared it with everybody. Um, so people just felt that this would last forever. And uh, that's part of the story. You know, you weave in such interesting tidbits into your overall prose, into the story of Harry and his exploits of World War II. And please explain, and I think our audience will be fascinated by this, the connection that the family had with, first of all, Charlie Chaplin, and then Harry's brief encounter with John Wayne. Uh, I just, you know, I just, you know, it just popped out at me. And I, I must admit that Charlie Chaplin, you know, um, became the godfather for a very famous Jewish fighter in England named Ted Kidd Lewis, who I'm writing about right now. So well, when I read that in your book, Pam, I, my eyes just got very big. So I'm going to stop and ask you because you're the you're the author here. Oh, no, thank you. Uh, no, this was a journey of discovery as a writer and a researcher because this was a family um, in in Japanese American society, right, that um, was white collar. The dad was very bright, very uh, had excellent English, even as an immigrant to the United States, um, was very entrepreneurial and they had risen to the middle class, but they did not have exceptional means and exceptional connections. But all of these famous people would pop up um, naturally during the course of the story. And one of them was Charlie Chaplin because um, his uh, butler, manservant, um, very devoted worker, uh, employee, uh, hailed from the same prefecture as Harry's father, right outside of Hiroshima. And Harry's father uh, met 
Charlie Chaplin a number of times, who was very gracious. And Charlie Chaplin loved Japan and had visited there and been treated, you know, as a royal guest at different points. And uh, so there was this kind of relationship of respect. And there's a photograph in the book of um, the patriarch Katsuji with Mr. Chaplin. And yeah, this was a delightful moment. Um, when everything looked bright in the US, when the family couldn't imagine war on the horizon, couldn't imagine that their luck of meeting these fabulous people and um, having these wonderful encounters while making a living would ever change. Uh, and then John Wayne, you know, the just being part of um, wartime, Harry was uh, involved in the Southwest Pacific, really from 1942 through 1945, uh, and was in danger during that time, uh, often deployed very close to the front lines as a bilingual interpreter of Japanese POWs, and also having fun when he was off and joining the shows and um, you know, really lapping up what he could of American culture always um, identifying as a proud American and, and coming into John, um, John Wayne's contact this way. And these were always precious moments for me um, when these people would magically appear, sometimes in conversation with Harry, sometimes as I was going through letters or documents, um, I would come upon them and ask him about them and, they, and he would expand. So thank you for that. I, you know, I, I can't, I can't not ask you this question after you just mentioned, you know, Charlie Chaplin and uh, John Wayne, because also Harry had a job very close to Disney Studios, and there were farm animals there, and uh, I, 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 I was just so astonished. <laughs> you know, I don't imagine farm animals at any studio. You know, large studio, of course, which was a uh, was it was you know, a product of that particular period, the 30s and the 40s. So why were there farm animals there, Pam? Well, you know, Disney, Walt Disney was such an innovator in, in the film industry and in animation. And like any good artist, um, he used models uh, to do his sketches and drawings. And he would look at deer, he would look at goats and cows and any animal you see in an early Disney film, he probably had... Um, a menagerie of them. And, um, and Harry would bring scraps from the produce shop um, for the animals to eat. And as a result, he got on someone's Christmas list at Disney Studios and received a beautiful holiday greeting card signed by Walt Disney with an original sketch. Uh, and it was because he delivered these buckets of scraps. Uh, and I just thought that was delightful and Harry remembered it. I kept that card for a long time, but then really felt um, that, you know, after Harry passed or even before that this is something the family should keep or donate to a museum. And I impressed upon them to do that. But it's really charming, even though it belies um, a really hard time in Harry's life, right? Because he was living hand to mouth. He didn't have the college education that his parents had always dreamed of. He um, could barely get by, was living in a rooming house, didn't know what was coming next, felt discriminated against, felt as if he had lost a lot of friends, but had these little moments. Um, interestingly, I get a lot of reader mail and one reader, and this is in a mat, a month, number of months ago, so very recent, um, wrote me that his family used to own that produce shop. And uh, he had read my book and um, he's looking more into his family history and wanted to know if I had any more information. And he himself is a graphic artist and he may do like a graphic novel treatment of his family history and Japanese American. And I was just so glad to have that exchange of conversation uh, so we're staying in touch, and uh, I look forward to seeing what he turns up as he does that uh, family study. That's 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 amazing. And now, you know, because you had mentioned about the hardships, and then you know, when World War II begins, um, of course, the Japanese are relocated uh, euphemistically to uh, called camps, but they really were concentration camps, as Judge Miho said, because guns were pointed inward. Um, one of the things that your book uncovers is the ability, of course. For some people to leave the camp, and I, I was amazed that Mary left, um, 
you know, and Harry also, will, I mean, the, if someone joined the 442nd or the um, 101 uh, battalions, um, they, of course, uh, went to fight. But I was unaware that other people uh, could leave under certain circumstances. And I, could you tell us the story of Mary? I mean, how did that happen? Well, um, Mary, unfortunately, had a very difficult marriage and uh, her husband, from whom she was estranged, even before camp, was sent to a different camp. And then she was with Harry and her young daughter, Jeannie, and the three of them were living together. Um, Harry ended up leaving first. He was at Gila River in Arizona by May of 1942, and he left um around Thanksgiving, right, of, of November 42. He could barely last six months. Um, entering the army was a godsend for him, for his self-esteem and, and sense of hope. Um, he was losing all hope um, of his status as an American and as a productive person while in camp. Uh, but he left Mary there and he felt quite guilty. Uh, but Mary understood why he was enlisting. And she was uh, a pretty industrious person herself. And I think the camps were expensive to maintain. People knew pretty quickly that they were not of value. Um, they were ostensibly erected suddenly and shabbily um, on the basis of national security. Um, it turns out that there has not been a single Japanese American who's ever been tried and found guilty of any acts of espionage during the entire war. And that was what they were suspected of. Uh, so the U.S. was also um, turning around events with the Battle of Midway in spring of 1942. So the threat seemed to be less imminent of um, just the capabilities of the Japanese military and the potential fear of an invasion in Hawaii or California or elsewhere on the elect along the West Coast. So there were there was a shortage of workers in various places, and there were cities like Chicago, where Mary went, where they needed workers, and they were willing to take Japanese Americans. They didn't have as much experience with them and had no reason to fear them. Even if they had experience with them, they, they would know not to fear them. And so there was this exodus of people to places where they could work on farms or, or work in cities. Um, Mary was a domestic worker, uh, but they their jobs were needed to, they had jobs that needed to be filled and they satisfied that. Um, and they, of course, they lost everything and redress um, in which President Reagan um, helped to um, issue an apology and his administration through that and Congress uh, provided $20,000 per former internee in the 1980s, um, he, you know, that was, did not go anywhere as far as necessary to address what people had lost. Um, but Mary did go to Chicago and ended up ultimately back in uh, California where she was happiest and had a much larger Japanese American community uh, to be part of too. So, you know, this was, you know, this was surprising to me. And, you know, the, of course, one of the interesting things about this in terms of contemporary life, both in Hawaii and in the entire United States is uh, we've had a, a candidate talk about, you know, um, locking up a lot of people, um, immigrants, and also that same person when president was um, talking about, um, you know, uh, different things about people that worshipped um, in uh, worshipped Islam and Muslims. And um, uh, it was not notable to me that the Japanese American societies were some of the first to say, no, you, you can't do this for an entire group of people. What are you, what are you talking about? You, this, this is a huge mistake during World War II. Let's not repeat that huge, terrible mistake. Now, that gets me to one of the key historiographical issues in your book, Pam, and you address it, um, uh, perhaps not uh, mean, meaning to, but you do address it. Um, and that is, you both show the horrible, and horrible isn't even a strong enough word, of the effects of the atomic bomb. Um, um, in Hiroshima. And I'd like you to just talk about that um, description. Counterposed to that, um, you talk about the Japanese willingness to fight to the last person that had um, Americans landed, as you said, on November 1st, um, 1945. 
that would have been horrendous um, if the Japanese had not surrendered because everyone was taught to fight. And in fact, one of the characters who Harry meets, um, who was an enemy of his in school, ironically, it's just an uncanny experience. Um, his parents, you know, there was a kind of a feeling in Japan that if you didn't come back, you know, if you if you came back alive, you know, that would hurt the family's honor. So how do you how do you square those two things? Because I was I was reading and, you know, when I came to the reactions to the uh, to the atomic bomb, I you know, you, as an American, you feel kind of like a war criminal because it's so it's so horrendous. But within the historical context, it's 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 a, it's a different matter. So I'm going to shut up now. You talk because it's your book. Oh, oh, no. no uh, so I also heard you talking about the road to war. Right. Um, yeah. I mean, and how these people were unjustly locked up and how it is um, considered a blot on the American constitution and American history. Um, Spark Matsunaga said that, and those words have really gone down to be true. Uh, the, the Supreme Court has um, recognized that its decisions uh, about the internment were also wrong when it upheld it on the basis of national security. And um, I fear because we see certain patterns in history, um, you and I as historians and many others, uh, that uh, if we're not vigilant about protecting our minorities and our, our new citizens and that we could repeat um, similar situations. And um, anytime we stereotype a group and vilify a group and erect tent cities, <laughs> we're, we're in trouble as a society. Those are not the best American impulses. We should be bigger than that. Uh, so that's one point. Um, the atomic bomb, I mean, I'm, I don't want to give away too much of the story, but except to tell uh, your viewers that there are immediate family members who are deeply affected by the bomb. Um, and I wasn't necessarily able to interview them, but I was able to interview other family members and they described everything in vivid detail to me. That's their recall. And as we know, memory can play tricks on anybody, no matter how crystal clear one's memory may be. Uh, but I was also able to corroborate um, memories because there was a neighbor longtime neighbor down the street who had been with um, Harry's mother on the day of the bomb. And I, literally, she walked me through every step of that morning. The bomb detonated shortly after 8 a.m. on a Sunday morning in Hiroshima. And um, she and uh, Harry's mom, Mrs. Fukuhara, uh, Kinu Fukuhara, had been up for hours to clear wood for fire breaks in case the Americans conventionally bombed um, Hiroshima. And so between her blow by blow uh, tallying of that day, the family members own accounts um, of what they heard um, from those eyewitnesses. And then my going into the archives in Hiroshima, which has neighborhood by neighborhood books that are diaries and um, announcement of notifications and clarifications of what happened next. Was there a shock wave or where was the, the mushroom cloud above? Um, I was able to piece it together. It was very much a puzzle. Um, it was a very difficult chapter to write because it is so horrible. Um, and these are innocent people who, who died uh, and largely women, children, and the elderly. Uh, and so I just had to write that in the mornings because if I wrote that at night, I would not be able to sleep and I just had to plow through it too. Uh, and then how do you match that with um, the Japanese determined to fight until the end, um, death before dishonor? And all I can say is that they're different. I mean, it is so true that the Japanese mentality during World War II was to never give up. Um, and if that meant dying in the process, so be it. Whereas Harry, um, as an American, would say that the American soldier's determination was to live to fight another day, right? They lived and to live to go home. Um, and he knew because he had gone to a version of JROTC in Japan when he lived there as a teenager before moving back to the U.S., that the Japanese thought differently. They were determined 
um, to fight until the end. And they were um, a worthy and ferocious and frightening opponent in the field um, for the allied forces. So um, I think one is a mentality for conducting war and the other, um, the other with the atomic bomb is a difficult question, right? I mean, what if um, the U.S. had not won? Would we, we be looking at a war crime? Um, and there are people who are more knowledgeable in all of the nuances of these issues. I felt that all I could do was to lay it out as authentically as possible and as accurately as possible and let the reader decide. So I try not to profess a point of view. Um, it's hard not to feel sympathy for the victims of the atomic bomb. You know, um, that's exactly what you did. And um, it's a very careful scholarship. And I, you know, I greatly appreciate that because it's, you know, it's people tend to, you know, um, you know, especially in this day and age when when politics are, are so crazy, um, that this is a very nuanced uh, discussion. Uh, one way or the other. And, you know, if you were a GI in Europe and you were to be sent to the Pacific, you probably had a, had a pretty good idea of what you wanted to have happen. Um, but on the other hand, if you read what happened to Harry's family, um, if you have any compassion in you whatsoever, you uh, think how terrible um, the aftermath of the atomic bomb. So I want to end on a bit lighter note, and that is you know, you, when you're going through your text, and I'm going through it right now, when you're going through your um, your uh, your book, which is, you know, not historical fiction. One of the lovely things that you do, Pam, is you you have these sayings, like in even part one, where it says, fortune is made of glass. And these are Japanese expressions. You put the Japanese in, you put the transliteration in, and then you put the English in. And that's spread throughout your work. And, you know, it's a credit to you uh, being uh, bilingual, or you know, I, I know that you from your earlier interview that you speak Spanish also, so try, you know, trilingual. Um, but I really admired that, and there were words that you used. And you know, living in Hawaii, people always say if you want to be strong, they they always come up to you and say gambate. You know? <laughs> <laughs> okay, but but I mean, why did you choose to do that? And um, it's really a lovely part of your book. Well, thank you, Carl. I mean, this is a bicultural story, right? This is a story of, of a family divided by war um, in two countries, speaking two languages, understanding both traditions. Uh, and in many cases, I go uh, kind of every other chapter, right? I alternate the narrative between Harry and Mary in the US or in the Southwest Pacific with Harry and his brothers and other family members in Japan. And I wanted to give um, kind of a 360 degree view, right? A full fledged um, perspective of both. And so Japanese is an exquisite language. Um, there are words in Japanese as in any foreign language that you can't quite express in English in the same way. And I I thought this book is so much about Japan, um, so much about balancing two traditions and 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 loving them both. And why not include um, some touches? And and that's part of what I love about having lived in Japan for 17 years, how exquisite the culture is. And um, this was one way for me to show that. Um, let me end just by saying um, that um, Dr. Pamela Rotner Sakamoto, not only did she live in Japan and, and speaks Japanese, but she always also worked for the American Holocaust Museum while she was there and in Washington, D.C. So this is a woman of enormous talent and um, enormous scholarship. And I'm not going to I'm not going to tell any more of the tidbits because there are, there are many more tidbits in this book that you would enjoy. And again, it's midnight in broad daylight. It's been out for how many years now, uh, Pam? We came out in January of 2016 in paperback in 2017, then in several other languages since it's been translated. And um, there may be something else happening with it, too. <laughs> oh, oh, that's great. I, 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 have, I, have, I, I have my suspicions, but I'm not going to mention anything. Um, um, in your life. And I want to leave, leave you with the, um, um, the last word as, you know, as a historian and as I know you teach and work and you are the head of a um, 
a, a specific uh, uh, institution at Punahou School. Um, but if you have any last words, and perhaps you can um, uh, sort of center your last words to the young people of Hawaii, um, and perhaps the entire United States, about you know becoming a historian and doing the really interesting work that you have done. And as I said before, this should accompany any um, class on World War II. This is a wonderful treat for anyone to read. Oh, thank you so much for your kind words. Uh, I guess my last words might be that uh, if we look closely all around us are fabulous stories that haven't yet been told and they may be hiding in plain sight and they um, may also encapsulate larger history, um, history of our nation, history of our nation's um, conduct with others, um, sort of the, the glorious um, mosaic that makes up the United States and never let those um, stories go untold. If you can tell one of them or if you can investigate or just be curious and open to reading about something you've never heard about before, uh, you not only expand your world, but those um, of others with whom you discuss it. And uh, uh, just a support for doing history, for writing, um, that we need those thinkers and writers as much in our world as, as ever, even as we go um, forward with a more technologically oriented and AI um, oriented world, uh, that there's no substitute for the hard research and the deep storytelling and the kind of reverence um, for our culture and other cultures. And I just feel really fortunate to have met the Fukuhara family for their generosity of spirit in sharing their story and for the many others with whom I spoke and uh, and to be able to to talk about it with a fabulous historian and, and uh, <laughs> scholar and teacher like you, Carl. And I co-coordinate the Davis Democracy Initiative at Punahou School in Honolulu with Dr. David Ball. And, and we want democracy to stay vibrant. And in many ways, this story is about citizens who are proud and caring and, and shared their compassion. So thank you. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Dr. Pamela Rotner Sakamoto. And um, this is Carl Ackerman, uh, Journeys of the Mind, um, part of Think Tech Hawaii, run by that wonderful mensch, Jay Fidel. A hui ho to all, and we hope that you have enjoyed this segment. Thank you. Thank you.